All right. Well, smaller crew tonight, but it's week of Thanksgiving, so you never know who's going to show. I know we've got at least one or two folks who said they want to tag along online, so we can keep an eye on the comments in case they say something. But the topic for tonight we wanted to kick around was what is the role of tradition in Christian faith? Back up a little bit and just talk about tradition in general. And we'll talk about how tradition affects things. Um, when I talk about, when I say the word tradition, what sort of activities or things come to your mind? Whether you open gifts on Christmas Eve or Christmas morning. All right. Whether you give gifts at all. So, like, you've got the holiday, Christmas, but how you get around, how you go at doing it are traditions. So, uh, actually, one of the earlier culture questions that I asked my wife was, what's your family do on Christmas? How you mish, how you match up your family practices, right? It, it's one thing to say, oh, I love Christmas. Well, what do you love about Christmas? <laughs> Late on Christmas Eve, when you're eating too much food, or do you love going to a candlelight service on Christmas Eve? You know, is this a stay home around the fire, or put on your Sunday best and go to that service? Tradition. Other things, traditions? Food. Food traditions? All right. <laughs> like what? Well, at New Year's, we have pork and sauerkraut. And mashed potatoes. Fosnox. All right, there's a Fosnox Bay for some folks. For other folks that didn't know Fosnox was a thing. <laughs> okay, but you're hitting on something here. Fosnox Day actually has roots in something. There's a reason that people have this need to eat all of in one day. Do you know the background of it? Yeah, it's the beginning of Latin. Beginning of Lent, so there's a church tradition that leads to a baking tradition. They got to get rid of a whole bunch of ingredients that aren't going to be used for the rest of the season. They want to go bad while everybody's fasting or, or whatnot. So we cook up a ton of these basically donuts, and everybody's got to eat them on that day because we're making too many of them on that day. And so a tradition of eating this thing is birthed. Years later, you know, how many people are celebrating Lent in any way that would prohibit them? Mm -hmm. And in our modern story, we think, you know, it's just not the issue of one. But, at least in this area, mm -hmm. the tradition of having to cook a ton of them on that way and they go eat them on that way. Well, I think like. Uh, Traditions often have some sort of a meaningful root. There's a reason for it. They tend to live on beyond. You know, we, we uh, in the interim, between the welcome video, this one played a clip of Fiddler on the Roof, and what's his, what's his name, Malik? We have these traditions, and they tell us who we are, and he says, ask me where they, where they come, came from, I'll tell you. I don't know. <laughs> <coughs> and I think that's more often than not the case. Um, my first trip to the Philippines, Christy said, hey, there's a birthday party. My friend is having a birthday party for her daughter daughter go while we're there. Sure, it's a good chance to get to know more of her friends, which is a good deal for me. So we'll tag along. And I forget, maybe she's watching comment what age it was. But it was a um, milestone one where you can throw a big party. Now here in the States, like, when's the first milestone birthday party that you would throw for 16? 16. Yeah, for most, yeah. If, if it's Spanish culture, we'll do 15. But we don't have a little kid milestone party. So when I showed up and realized they had rented a location with decorations and catering and, you know, all kinds of, I was almost lost. And I'm asking Christy, well, what is this? And she said, well, it's the birthday party for, I forget what they call it. What does it mean? Uh, well, you know, and all through this, this, the party, I'm leaning over. What's this mean? What's this mean? They asked if I would pray to bless opening of it. I'm like, I don't even know what I'm supposed to pray for. <laughs> like, are there certain things I'm supposed to mention? 
And uh, she she struggled, you know, well, I mean, thanks for help and good life. And I don't know. So she leans over to her mom, asks the question, what are the traditions and the, you know, the ideas associated with this kind of party? Her mom kind of fumbles around and asks everybody at the table. Nobody had a clue, but everyone was just sure we need to do this thing. <laughs> And the only reason that it would be becoming a problem was this foreigner at the table asking too many questions. <laughs> but this is how tradition kind of works. You don't always do traditions with this whole head knowledge of it means this. You just do it. And you just know to do it. It's intuitive. It's instinctual. We all know that's what you do. And so when the, when 16 is coming up, you don't know why to make a big, I mean, you might have some hunches that they can drive, or, but even if a kid doesn't have his license, we still feel like 16 is the one where you celebrate driving. I mean, in Pennsylvania, you can only get your permit, and it's going to take you a good six or more months. So half our kids are 17 before they ever get their <coughs> license, but 16 is when you do the driving birthday party. Why? Well, you used to actually get your license at 16. Lots of kids. I'm old enough that the most law changes were right after me. So when I got my permit, if I wanted to come back the next day for my license test, I could. There was no requirements on how many hours or how many miles or like how fast the test I could get it. So most of my friends and older contemporaries did get their license at 16. So 16 was the driving birthday party. It's not synced anymore, but that's still the number. We don't think it out. We don't know the background. We, you know, you give us another couple decades, and nobody will know why it's sixteen. <laughs> but we all know. Oh, you're they're turning sixteen. Are we going to do something? Hey, does anyone know if they're doing a party? If I didn't get them a gift all the last fifteen years. I might feel like I should give them something for sixteen. Tend to give them money. Why? So it's an instinctive. There is a code of conduct that goes with tradition shapes how you do things, expectations of what you do and don't do. Let's take Christmas, since it's, you know, what's coming up. What are Christian, or not Christian, Christmas traditions? What are things you instinctively know to do because it's Christmas? <coughs> Even if you don't know why. Maybe especially if you don't know why. Up a tree. All right, we, we kill a pine tree, put that dead sacrifice in our you know, put a pine tree. Christmas tree is uh, set up with it. When you guys do a tree, how does your family do the tree? Are there traditions that go with that? When you put it up, or how you put it up, or who puts it up? Live tree, fake tree? We used to always do live until we got older. And then now we do artificial. <laughs> I had some friends that was part of growing up was the comes day when the family goes out together to pick out your Christmas tree. I mean, it's not like dad just picks it up on the way home from work. You see what I mean? You don't think about, why can't dad just pick it up? And that's not how you do it. Now, my family did fake trees the whole time, so I was older the first time someone informed me we had, and I was the one going, why? We're just picking out a tree. Why do you need me? There's four of you going, which is more than enough to haul this thing. You know, and I'm being... But when I, when you violate a tradition, that does stuff too, right? I'm I'm coming from no tradition of picking out live trees, so to me, I've got no expectation, no intuitive. You should do this, and I'm just going. It's way more efficient if a couple of y'all go find a tree and bring it back, and you know I'll just be here. But I'm breaking the tradition if we all go together to pick it out. So. For those who have the tradition of going together, my not doing it, what's that say to them? They don't care about your tradition. Yeah, but they didn't say that. They didn't feel like they didn't care about the tradition. They felt like I didn't care about Christmas, family. They were suddenly bigger than the tree. I'm the Bah Humbug guy for Christmas. Yeah. We're trying to celebrate getting the Christmas spirit and go pick out a tree. Do you want to stay home? Tim, you need to get into this. Are, are you, you know, why don't you want to be a part of this? So when you break tradition, you don't just insult the tree or the tradition. You always insult something larger. If I said, you know, I, I, I did when I was in the Philippines, I said, why are we making such a big deal about a kid when they're too young to remember any of this? It seems like 
okay, I'm going, I'm the guy who's not in sync with the tradition. I'm going, what a waste of money to do such a big deal over a birthday party when they're too young to remember it. This is silly. I don't want to do this. You know, I don't even want to go. But now, I'm not insulting their budget choices. I'm insulting their kid, <laughs> their parenting, their value on life and celebration of youth. All kinds of values that are embedded in the tradition come out when you break the tradition. What other Christmas traditions do you have? And Cookies what would you... Okay. And milk. Cookies on the shelf and milk, right? That's for Santa to come and get, which is actually mom and dad while you're sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, you can act shocked. We never did that one. <laughs> now, if I say, if you grew up doing that, and I say I don't want to do that, what, what feels insulted? You grew up I was never doing really cared. Which is for me. <laughs> no. Probably be told that I'm not being festive, not having fun. It usually comes from families that are big on the storytelling side. Yeah, I'm too serious and not having fun. These are parts of how we have fun. So it's not really about whether you believe in Santa Claus or not. That's about whether you're having fun and kicking back and being silly on all of that. There's always a value in it. You didn't insult Santa, you insult me. I know you have fun. I didn't insult the Christmas tree. I insulted family unity. You know, not doing this thing together. So in tradition, there's always this value system. Something comes with it. Eggnog. Egg, yeah. I've already went out and bought some eggnog for the season. I did that before Thanksgiving even happened. Um, so let's come around then. What are some of your family traditions? Not, not holiday related to Christmas, but makes a king a king or a shoemaker a shoemaker or whatever. Or even if you have some friends that have weird traditions, you know. Yeah, so I had this weird moment. I was hanging with these friends, even they all did this, and I've never seen them before. They're family traditions. Yeah. Uh, when when you're talking about Christmas, when do you open the gifts? Do you, you know, do you do it at night? Do you, the night before? Some people do one gift the night before. Some do it first thing in the morning. Some people do it right before they have their meal, you know. And, you know, there's no rhyme or reason to that either. So just looking at tradition in general, I guess what I want to get is chewing on it. What does tradition do for you? You all have traditions, whether you thought about it or not. It's easy to have tons that you didn't even know was a tradition until somebody else doesn't do it. Right? First time I walked into a house in Singapore, and I walked into the dining room, and everybody kind of looked at me until I realized that I forgot to take my shoes off at the door. I put the shoe holder. I realized I had broken a tradition. I was fine, but I didn't have that tradition. I didn't even notice my shoes were so on the invisible to me. But for them, my shoes off meant I'm not being off man how security. In our house, uh, we had a, a rather sporadic meal process during the day for the breakfast, depending on who had to go early. But supper time was always all the family eats together. We held up supper till till the last one came in the door, and we, we ate together as a family at the table, not on TV trays. <clears throat> all right. Now you you made a comment there at the end that already was a huge art tradition, not what those other people do. Why? Why? Why not on TV trays? Well, um, there were other yeah there there are other people that uh, the TV was central to their evening time, and so they didn't they didn't eat together. They took their meal at the in front of the TV set. Uh, so eating at the table was a big 
as a tradition, carries the sense that we're going to be together as a family. Mm -hmm. Get to Immediately, it wasn't just a, well, you know, the house is kind of small, so it's more functional to have something else. It goes to a value of, are we being together as a family? Are we centering around each other? Or are we centering on something else? And I would hazard, as one who grew up at home, I remember the family at a friend's house, and they got out TV trays. The TV wasn't even on. But I felt let down that we were eating. Well, you, you know, you make it, it's nice to say, oh, we're circling around the TV and just being distracted. Well, we weren't, but it still bothered me <laughs> because I had attached to them one value system. You eat on those if you're going to just sit and watch movies instead of be together. And so to sit at the TV trays with the TV off, I still felt like we lost some family. What does tradition do? When you've got these traditions and you're having these moments where it shapes how you feel or makes you you know, not like something or love something. What is the role of tradition in your life? What does it do to you? Why do we make traditions? Why do we care about traditions? What purpose do they serve? Some some of the traditions, um, you, you don't even remember that you have them, but they build order into your life that makes it so you don't have to work through a decision process about whether you're going to or not going to, or when you're going to, if you're going to. Like, and I'll give an example is, we have never put up a Christmas tree before Thanksgiving. And typically in our house, the day after Thanksgiving is the day we start putting up the tree up. I say start, because sometimes it's a, it's an assembly process. We erect the tree from the various parts that uh, fake trees have. And the decorating of the tree, which is a lot longer process, may stretch out over a week. But none of that begins before Thanksgiving Day. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you point out is since there's a timing for it, there's also a feeling of lateness. So if the, we're all busy at Thanksgiving, the tree doesn't come up. Now, a week later, there's this sense of disappointment. We still haven't got the tree up. What's wrong with us? Frustration with each other. Why can't you all get home enough for us to get this done? And urgency. We need, I mean, in the same sense, when I was standing in the living room with my shoes at Chris's house, there was a sense of lateness. You should have already taken your shoes off by now. Urgency. We need to get this guy back to the door and get the shoes off right now. Now, I can be sitting there wanting to talk about something, and nobody wants to talk. Until we get back on track, because we're late. So you might want to oh, go caroling. We can't go caroling. The tree's not up yet. Now, on their own, those are just two X. Christmas night, you put up a tree and do some caroling. But the traditions shape how you interpret those events. What I want you to get is we all have traditions, we all interpret by tradition. That's just. Whether you like it or not, even if you don't like the traditions you grew up with, you still interpret by them. Are we late? Are we on time? Is this working right? Is this going badly? And underneath of it, usually we're ascribing value judgments to things. So what are some Christian traditions that, that you like? Um, <coughs> this might not be a long-standing Christian tradition, but with our church, that when you guys are gone, Said the, the service should go on as it always goes on, like when you're here. So, okay, you know what I'm saying? When, 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 uh, so I'm pastor of Christ's house. When I leave, everyone feels the need. This is how Tim always did it. This is how we must do it. Which is funny because some of them might just be doing what works for me. So, yeah, it's not, it's not even necessarily must do it, it's just that this is how we. And so, if, if, if we depart from that, there's probably some <laughs> folks who will go, but, uh, or I'll give you another one from our church. Um, we sit at tables. So, your chair's sitting out, so rather than sitting at pews or just in chairs, we have chairs around tables for the whole service, which is unique. Now, that began because we were renting the basement of the church. 
and when I came down early on, the tables were already set up. And rather than take them all down, I just figured it was easier because I was setting it up all by myself when we started to just pull them into a loop and let people sit at tables. There was no strategic, logical, it was just convenience. But after a few months of doing that, I had more volunteers helping me, and so we took all the tables down, set up chairs. And I immediately heard from members going, why don't we have tables? At Christ House, we sit at tables. Hmm. They didn't say we used to have tables. Mm -hmm. This was like an identity statement. Right. We're a church that sits at tables. I didn't realize that I had accidentally <laughs> made a tradition. <laughs> And like the Fosnox, it evolved out of necessity, and it outlived the necessity. Um, but they all told me they'd, they'd come to see meaning in it. They liked the fact that we encouraged them to take notes. It, right. It didn't necessarily outlive. That one didn't necessarily outlive the necessity because it really is a good way of doing it. Yeah. Well, in our current building, we're back to going to a building that already has a table set up, so it's back to being easier yeah, again. Sure. Um, but then we got to the point where the other building, they actually didn't have the table set up, and we were setting them up for for our church. Um, it found its it it found me. For most of our folks do this because they like to make notes because in our groups we circle around a table and have a table discussion. And we eat at those tables afterwards. So the tables have become a neat picture of fellowship and study, dialogue, and that we're not just sitting and hearing a lecture with a it's interactive. It didn't begin with that plan, but it it, it still swallowed up some values that when you took the tables down it wasn't just a, oh, we don't have tables anymore, but now we can't take notes. So they interpreted seating, they interpreted <clears throat> unity, they interpreted the attitude of worship through the lens of a tradition. What other traditions do we have in churches? I'm just saying, like for instance, let me give you an example. You've got different things. You've got Christmas, then you've got all the traditions of Christmas. Uh, what are some baptism traditions? Different church, the very church, church. Well, uh, I'm, I'm aware of one church that whenever anybody trusts the Lord, they immediately, that that service immediately ends with a baptism because they value baptism. They actually, their their teaching was actually that the person wasn't saved until they completed the baptism. So you know, but that is the approach. The baptism should be done immediately. And then you go to a church and someone accepts Christ and then the water comes out. That feeling of lateness. Why are we going to get this guy wet? Why are we waiting? Like, it's going to gnaw on you because we might wait six months to years. This is some of our traditions. Right? We make that just a later thing whenever you want. So, yeah. Immediacy was part of your tradition. We all agreed you should be baptized. But you've got a tradition of doing it immediately, whether for theological reasons or even without. Some churches just do it because they got water ready all the time anyway. Um, I know tons of stories of like YWAM and other groups where someone gets saved and they just fill up the bathtub and dunk them because why not? That's kind of their stance. So it's not a theological so much, but there is part of the celebration is getting this person wet. And so you kind of rob them of their joy. It's like they're going to think maybe you're not as excited as they are about someone getting saved because you lazy mom won't even get the water out. Other baptism traditions. There's more than just doing it immediately. And how might they shape what people think? How people think and feel about it? Wearing white robes and just following the clothes. Yeah. So um, in Lacey Christian in New York, where I was associate pastor, <coughs> Spanish church, obviously by the name. It is important. Baptism is done in white robes. They don't have any white robes. They have to borrow them from another church. But they have a relationship with the Brethren Church that lets us use their old choir robes. <laughs> their baptism robes. It's a good deal. Yeah. So then when we started the next step over in York, which is where I was pastor before, um, being a church plant of Iglesia Christiana, we did white robes for baptism. Because this tradition is inherited. I didn't, that was, I'd never grown up with white robe. I didn't know that robes for baptism was a thing. Because grown up Baptist, you know, we're just about dunking. And we usually have a little lecture about if you're going to wear a white shirt and wear another shirt under it. A little bit of modesty instructions. But beyond that, you can get baptized just about anything you want. And so I'd never, I had never thought about clothing. 
beyond making sure it's modest. I would. Um, I've been to a couple of you guys with baptisms, and I don't remember what you are. Had no meaning to me because I had no tradition. It made no significance. But for others, when they have a tradition, they notice. Um, they would talk about this picture of, as I come to Christ, He clothes me in white. I've been washed in the blood and white as snow. And when I come into heaven and talk about being clothed in white gowns, and so this picture of baptism of having the white gown, and they're all kinds of fun stuff. They Imagine how they feel when they come to one of my plain clothes baptisms. <laughs> Why are they going to put the robes on? Why aren't they putting the robes on? Do they not celebrate the new life and the membership and being washed clean? Do these people not take holiness seriously? Do they baptize them in whatever? They don't baptize them in the white robes? Here are the lamb. None of this, we haven't cited a verse on baptism that says, Thou shalt wear thy white robe <laughs> and thou gettest dunked. You know, but tradition shapes how. We all agreed you should baptize them. But tradition shaped how you thought we were doing on it. And, and potentially deepened the meaning for some, uh, potentially made it difficult for some. Even if they didn't, if you said, Oh, you're just being traditional, they said, No, I just care about baptism. Everybody's just trying to love Christmas, love baptism. Other traditions in the church that we interpret them. Having Sunday school, which did not exist for 1,800 years of the church, but now is so entrenched that if you found that the church that you're going to doesn't have Sunday school, you'd think they're gone liberal. Okay. So, and for the record, the church I lead does not have Sunday school. <laughs> And I remember when we were getting ready to plant, um, a friend, a friend's mom was chatting with me about it. She's asking how we're planning to do this, that, and the other thing. She said, what's your plan for Sunday school? And I said, I don't plan to have Sunday school. I didn't even get to explain why. And, you know, our bigger picture of discipleship and family integrated. The look on her face told me she already was making value judgments and, and confused because she knew me. And what she knew about me didn't fit with what she felt about not doing Sunday school. <laughs> so what sort of things is she assuming when someone says, I don't want to do Sunday school? For the record, she helps teach and coordinate Sunday school at her church. <laughs> She's all in. You don't care about the kids. Yeah, that's tradition. The youth are tomorrow's leaders. We're supposed to run up, and you're just canceling their program. You don't, have, you don't care about kids. You don't care about investing and discipling young people. That to not do Sunday school for her is a when are we going to care about the kids? Why don't we care about the kids? I spent 17 years of youth ministry, so she knew I care about the kids, and so she was both concerned and deeply confused how I, of all people, could commit this crime. I explained my, myself to you guys. I just don't see it that way. <laughs> Tradition gives you experiences to tie your convictions and beliefs to. So even when I explained it, she has no experience of doing it another way. And so all she really is left with, understandably, is a concern that we're losing something vital. How many times did you get baptized? You got baptized twice, right? Got a couple double dunkers in here. <laughs> True Anabaptists. Yeah. Be baptizers. Um, I got baptized once. Yeah. So you're on the, the single. So when I think of baptism, <coughs> I think of my baptism. It's the only experience I got. I've seen others, but they weren't meaningful to me because I didn't get wet. And you can tell me about other ways of doing baptism. They are somewhat uncomfortable just because they're foreign. I read through the rest of my experience and I'm most comfortable with my experience. And so I speak as one whose baptism theology shifted massively. And long after I was intellectually convinced of a different position, I wasn't sure I was willing to make the move just because it was so uncomfortable. Because I'm still feeling the thing through my traditions. Did you want me to put this in the fridge? Yeah, thanks. Thank you. More coffee?
right on it. I might just read some more. Though. That's fine. Okay, we'll, nice. we'll drink fresh food. Fresh coffee from <laughs> online. Is the so, you can't escape tradition. Tradition can have some good roles and mean deep, meaningful things to how you do it. You have to have some way of doing things, so you, you've got to have tradition. You're going to have tradition one or another. Um, but tradition can also be an obstacle and a barrier. You know, when someone's saying, here's a way to do something better, your dad mentions Sunday school doesn't have deep roots. And the jury is out on its fruitfulness. <clears throat> we have not seen the generational passing of the faith, faith happening well in, in the last century which used to be something that was taken for granted. It's like families that were Catholic stayed Catholic, families that were Protestant stayed Protestant, because the generational passing, everybody had, was that, whether that was just because they all lived in Protestant Catholic towns and villages, or, you know, I'm not saying that Sunday school ruined it as a guarantee, but it doesn't have a, a strong track record to prove that it isn't a contributing factor to our loss of generational faith passing. So it's not a given that it's, getting the job done. And yet, when we care about the kids, we still have a hard time doing anything but going back to the tradition we grew up in. I experienced Sunday school. <clears throat> One of the dangers is pastors. Most of us who are pastors are pastors because we did okay. We did okay in the church. It's not totally true of me, but for a lot of guys, they actually love church. That's why we're pastors. Which makes it very hard for them to know how the church can engage people who hate church. You say, oh, we got to get rid of this. I love that. Just the na nature of your profession tends to filter out the guys right. who hated everything that was going on in there. And so sometimes we don't know how, how to change uh, One thing my uh, dad's church does, I think it's once every two months, they do feet washing. Okay. The whole church. In the Brethren Church is big on foot washing. A lot of them will even link that up as part of the communion practice. We haven't done communion if you don't do foot washing. That's a precursor to a love feast. Or it is a love feast, foot washing, then communion. Yeah, I think. But there's there's this love feast big meal, there's this foot washing ritual, and then communion. So imagine when they visit my church. We do communion every week. We do it before we eat. We don't call our meal a love feast, and no feet are really washed that I can tell <laughs> <laughs> in process. You could feel like maybe we're watering down communion. We're not coming to it with an attitude of humility because we don't wash each other's feet. But those of you who didn't grow up with foot washing didn't even notice that it wasn't there. You're not thinking, I haven't really washed feet yet. So it's a lens. It communicates values, it embeds values, it trains your appetites for those values. You feel something when it's not done. You feel like we're not being humble, or you feel like I'm being dirty. Even if my shoes are completely clean, when I didn't take them off the door instead of the living room, you feel, not just think, you feel <clears throat> like a dirtiness is going to leave your house. It trains appetites. Well, well, you know, what I was just thinking of this. What I think is weird about like what you learned or traditions is, and I guess I'm just speaking myself, like the church I grew up with, I don't agree with pretty much at all. Okay. But I was taught communion with using wine and we took our first communion at 13. And despite the fact that I pretty much reject everything about that church, to this day, if I had my pr preference, it's communion wine. would be wine, and and I and I know it's just because that's well, how it was first taught, and it was taught to me to be meaningful, and emotionally it is more meaningful. And we've talked about your heart's there, right? Well, and we've talked about that in terms of like I sort of see you know regular communion more as just like a sociological event. And I do think when I take it with wine, I do see it more pushes you to go more deeper with it. Yeah, more of spiritual, you know. So, so that's what we're saying. Is tradition helps you deepen your experience of it. Right. And so here's the funny thing. Intellectually, I agree that it was wine when they had communion in the Bible. 
on a very basic level. We couldn't pasteurize grapes to make it keep so very recent history. And that was Methodist. Welch's was a Methodist, um, not elder, but steward. And he pioneered pasteurizing grape juice just so that they could do communion without wine. Um, so I know that historically we've always used wine. Biblically, they were using wine. No problem saying wine is more authentic, but I grew up on grape juice. Communion was always grape juice. And so even though intellectually I'm fine with it, personally, <coughs> it's weird and distracting when it's wine. <laughs> He's going, it's deeper and more meaningful. I'm like, when it's grape juice, I'm at home doing communion like we always do. That's the communion of my childhood, mm -hmm. my first communion. Yeah. And wine is the, of course, I grew up heavily in teetotal or movies. We're bringing alcohol back into the discussion. How do I feel about this? As if somebody's going to get drunk on communion wine. Right. You know, like, I'm having value <laughs> issues that are not based on, like, just like my clean shoes were not making the house dirty by saying living room. Right. right. And there's probably no drunkenness risk with having communion wine. Especially but, the way we do it, dipping the. But honestly, the in. what I'm feeling mm. is exactly what they felt. The Methodist uh, steward that pushed for it was a teetotaler. He wanted to see alcohol removed. He felt like drunkenness was a problem. He was a prohibitionist. And he felt this deep discomfort with pushing for a prohibition of alcohol and closing down the bars while going to church and having wine. And so to get wine out of the church, they had slogans about don't give your people the devil's drink at the Lord's table. That deep seated concern over all alcohol. Yeah. You you what you hear there is somebody who's deeply uncomfortable. <laughs> right. And so it's funny to make that traditional skip, I have to overcome my traditions. Not the tradition so much as the way tradition has trained my right. appetites. But like I said, what's weird to me is the fact that it still has a hold on me, despite the fact that nothing else over there that you want to go back to. <laughs> right. You know. Yeah, going, and I love what they preach next to you. Like, nope. <laughs> um, love their doctrine. Say, it. nope. Yeah. Well, it's you know, I'm not in the denomination I grew up grew up in, so it's not, and I did not grow up with weekly communion. You know? so it's not that I can't change and grow, and and yet there's still a sense of that homeness. Um. Any thoughts when come to scripture? Because the role is that question. That, what is the role of tradition? In Christian faith. And I want you to say that we all have tradition. Tradition is a role in your faith. It does shape how you think, how you feel, how you practice it. So, what what would Scripture call us to? This has been something where the church has had big fight in terms. Um, there are basically two two and a half camps. Um, if you were to go to a Catholic or Orthodox church, they would talk about holy tradition or sacred tradition, which is a very technical term. They would say that there are traditions that have been passed down from the apostles through the bishops, the patriarchs, and that they are guides for how we interpret scripture. And so holy tradition and scripture are two sources of truth. And to, scripture must be read in agreement with holy tradition. So there's a body of binding tradition we need to do so from their place. Tradition is vital to the Christian faith. If you get out of tradition, you probably don't know how to read the Bible. And so and so if you're gonna practice your faith, you practice not a tradition, the tradition, capital T. In the Reformation, you have folks saying we feel like the traditions are wrong. We've got traditions that don't agree with Scripture. And tradition submits to Scripture. So rather than Scripture is interpreted through tradition, tradition is submitted to Scripture. It's not by And so you hear things like sola scripture and the Reformation Scripture alone. What sola scripture meant in practice to reformers was not tradition. A 
all better? Yeah. There's a little kid turning the school. Thank you. Um, so for the reformers, sola scripture, and generally speaking, Protestantism, while there might be a place for some retention of tradition and Lutheran to retain more, Anglicans more, um, Baptists less, Mennonites, you know, passionately less, uh, brethren passionately less. The main thing is they're saying tradition is not going to be an authority in how we interpret. We're going to do scripture alone is how we base it. So if when I say the word tradition and Christian faith, if you grew up Protestant, the odds, and then still are Protestant, um, you tend to think of tradition somewhat negatively. It's a thing that gets in the way of doing it right. Pure faith is a faith that doesn't need doesn't have tradition. It's just always kind of a bad word. If you grew up Orthodox or Catholic tradition gets a capital P and is said with reverence for it's like holy and sacred, it's something to be revered and submitted to. And a good Christian is a tradition keeping Christian. It's a big difference. How does scripture talk about tradition? Well, the first verse I thought of uh, when you asked that question, it was Proverbs 22 28, which says, Do not remove the ancient landmark which your fathers have set. Uh, this, many of the Proverbs, and this is one of those, is not in a context that gives you an idea of the specifics of, of what it's referring to. Uh, and so, is it talking about uh, land landmarks is it talking about traditions uh, that have been established through the elders of the church or the elders of the the uh, of Israel? Uh, we don't know, but I just that verse comes to mind every time I think about when we're going to change something that is viewed as traditionally we do it this way. I have this check in my spirit that says be very careful here. That, that the landmarks that we change uh, have more purpose in the change than the purpose for which they were established. I know if someone visited Christ House, they would say, well, you guys seem to be a more traditional, uh, or tradition-oriented uh, Protestant church because we do some of the older church traditions. We do communion, recited prayers, uh, corporate scripture reading. What's interesting <clears throat> is I did not start out as a church planter with a goal of being traditional. I did what every church planter does. Let's start with a clean slate and do it right. The problem is I'm also a research junkie. And I'd start with these <coughs> values of what I knew biblically a church ought to be. It's like, well, how would you do that? Grappling with the failures in current systems, reading, and then she said, well, you know, you need to have some sort of a system for imparting the faith. And it needs to be something that's repeatable and memorizable for all ages. And Next thing you know, I'm going, so that's why they catechize. Huh. I just thought that was an old thing to be done away with. And then when you start coming up with ways of imparting faith, like, well, you got to memorize it. For little kids, they need to start with memorization and they can understand later. So you almost would do a catechism and a confirmation type process. I mean, you maybe whether you call it what you will. Mm -hmm. Practice of these values will lead you into this kind of a tradition, sort of inevitably. And what you have in the traditions is a highly refined process of doing that's been tweaked over centuries. Sometimes that tweaking is bad. But a lot of times, it's just overcoming things that don't work. When you try to do it that way, it won't work. We practice with people along, you know, some of these things hundreds of years, and we can tell you, if you care about this, this is a pretty good way to get it done. Um, you want to tell people they should all read their Bibles. It turns out lecturing them every week to read their Bibles does not make people read their Bibles. But if you read scripture in your service every week, then everybody reads scripture once a week, bare minimum. It's just the baseline. And if they hear it read over and over, they retain it. I, I read of a speaker who said, he goes and teaches Bible literacy to both Protestants and Catholics. And he says, Protestants know, their Bible, know that they know their Bibles well, but don't know it as well as they think. Catholics don't think they know their Bibles at all. I know more Bibles than they think.
it over and over in services. They just didn't know all that stuff with scripture half the time. And you'll start into a new verse and they'll go, oh yeah, and they finish it. Because they got this process of recitation. They just need someone to index it, sort it, topical, you know. Whereas the Protestants didn't know so much. But if you said baptism, a couple of them could give you verses on baptism. If you said tithing, they could give you, they, they got a better sorted, smaller check. And it was just an interesting observation. It wasn't to pick a size. Yeah. Well, in a modern way of that, I always say it's like, I know the Bible says this. Don't ask me where. You know, and that's why I love Google, because if somebody says, well, where does it say it? I can say, where does the Bible say blah, 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 blah. Yeah. <laughs> and invariably, their verse is there. It's just, I'm not good at remembering where. So, In the Old Testament, there's a lot of intentional tradition building that God does. Some of the marker stones that might be what Proverbs refers to. When Israel comes into the land of Canaan, God parts the Jordan River. <coughs> they cross through it. And he says, take a leader of each of the tribes and take a stone. And they stack some of them. There's things like that. There's several places where they do stone stacks. And he usually gives these instructions. Like, if kids ask, what is this? Tell them a story. That's traditions. But there's a marker stone and there's a story. When, when the, here I raise my Ebenezer in the old hymn. And we go, what's an Ebenezer? Mm -hmm. They actually made a stone pile called Ebenezer, which means, by your help, I'm taught. Because they had just come through a battle where God delivered them. And they couldn't do it on their own until God came through and God delivered them. And so here's this pile of stones. And when the kids say, what's that? Well, that's Ebenezer. It's a reminder that we came here by God's help. We couldn't get here on our own. We didn't just take the land on our own. So these traditions have values in it. If you pass by that stone pile and don't ask what it means... You must not care about God's help. You arrogant stone. <laughs> you thought you were in a hurry. I think you're irreverent. It's not a tradition. But the tradition also a teaching value. Um, here's some verses. There's 13 uh, references in the New Testament that use the word tradition. Um, so, um, which is paradosis. There's some positive and some negative verses. I thought that was interesting because depending where you grew up, you know half of these verses. <laughs> I grew up knowing the negative ones, full disclosure. And when I stumbled on into in my adulthood that there were positive verses that reference traditional in the investment, I was actually, I didn't know those existed. <laughs> I'm sure I heard them read, but from where I stood, that just went up. Right on my so I'm just going to read a couple of them. Um, actually, let me get a couple of others. There's a couple of passages. Are you, are you going to define which ones are positive? Generally speaking, when Jesus is talking in the Gospels, we get negative references to tradition. Hmm. He'll be able to tell from the passages. We'll look at them together. Uh, Paul references tradition in his letters in some negative and positive ways, but mostly positive. Same word. Um, so when I look at Matthew 15, just two, three, and six, but if someone wants to read what it, 15, two, three, two, three, and six have the word, but if you want to read a, a chunk of it, it flows. Okay. Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And he said to them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded saying, honor your father and your mother and he who curses his father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father and mother, whatever prophet you have received from me is a gift to God. Then he need not honor his father and mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites. And he goes on. I think the NIV says something like you have a fine way of avoiding the tradition of God, or the commandments of God with your tradition. <laughs> um, but yeah, similar. For the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. Now this one. 
Did you catch the opening one? They're doing exactly what we all do with Trishina. Disciples apparently grab a bread without washing their hands. Like me standing in the living room with my shoes on in an Asian culture, right? And they're all going, their hands aren't washed. Now, I want you to understand, the hand washing they didn't do it was probably a ceremonial hand washing, something to a your finger. What you do is come in. They might have done a fuller hand washing, but either way, they have a tradition about washing your hands. And Jesus' disciples are not washing their hands. And they are uncomfortable. They're interpreting it as some sort of disgrace, some sort of moral failure. It's not just your disciples are dirty. They don't respect the elders. See how tradition just doing what tradition does. What's Jesus come back to them? What's Jesus is concerned? Is he uses the same word, well, okay, you want to talk tradition? So you've got this tradition where a kid can um, claim some of his stuff is set apart for God's use, and if he's set apart for God's use, then he doesn't have to honor his parents with it. And so it's kind of created a loophole. You want to keep your parents from getting your stuff, even though the commandment says honor your mother and father, you just go, well, the tradition says that anything that's been offered and dedicated to God is exempt from that. So I'll just label it, set aside, and now I want the hook on the commandment. What's Jesus doing in pointing out this loophole in how they rock in the tradition and the law? Well, Christ, I believe, always goes back to the heart. It, the first, I mean, to me, it always seems like the first consideration is why you're doing something and, and what your motivation is. And then the second consideration is what are you actually doing? Are you doing what you right. I mean, does Jesus point that we should not dedicate things to God? No. <laughs> right. But if you use it as a way to undermine and contradict what God has said, your tradition's in trouble. Right. This is the kind of tradition which is I'm most familiar with. Right. Tradition as an obstacle to obedience to God's word. So the traditions he's talking about are not the biblical ones. Not, hey, put the stone pile here and tell your kids that's a commandment of God's word. He's saying... You've got biblical commands and then traditions that are built around that and are meant to agree with it, but people are manipulatively using them mm -hmm. to undermine the clear teaching of Scripture. I got a rabbit hole for you. Sure. Do you think that um, if you go clear back to Genesis, that the first mm -hmm. example of what you were saying and putting stuff around God's word that's human is seen in Eve's conversation with the serpent because Adam is told don't eat of the tree. Eve reports don't eat don't or touch, touch of the tree. And and I, I tend to think, and, and I've heard it argued, that they weren't told not to touch it. You know, that that was Adam's additional because instruction. you have to. Every commandment, you have to figure out what to do with it. I say, don't eat it. Well, how are we going to not eat it? Are we going to hang out under it all day? Are we going to prune it and juggle it? You know, his application of that command was, don't touch. And yeah, what she says isn't the word for word command. She's living in tradition. Um, to some extent, you know, how much of a problem that is, I don't think the passage indicts it clearly. So it could be good, could be bad, depending on how you saw the rest. Uh, Mark 7, 3, 5, 8, 9, 13 is the same story we just read in Matthew, told again in Mark. Um, and it plays out the same way. The only thing I'd say is, verse 13, it says, Thus, speaking, speaking of what they do, it says, Thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. Many such things you do. So he's pointing out that it's not just that he's got to be with one tradition. But there's a whole body of traditions that seem to be getting in the way. This makes sense. A tradition shapes how you interpret it. If you have bad tradition, then you have lots of things that make you actually poorly interpret. They probably think you're honoring mom and dad just fine. Because everybody was comfortable with the way you did that. Because tradition trained us all to say, that's how you do that. That's fine. And he said, I wish you felt as uncomfortable with how your traditions are violating scripture. That you feel uncomfortable with my disciples by washing their hands. 
juices are messed up because your appetites are messed up. You're missing the point. So he is affirming the tradition interprets. You're seeing it out the passage. The concern is when a tradition leads to a wrong interpretation that actually contradicts God. Um, so these are our negative ones. Let's see. There's one more negative one. Two, two more. Uh, Paul, Paul twice. One that's uh, maybe negative, maybe not. Galatians 1, verse 14. Paul's telling his own story and his own pedigree. And he says, And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. So Paul is a passionate practitioner of all the Jewish tradition. And the only reason you say that's negative is he recognizes that he still needed to get saved in front of Jesus. And that his zealous practitioner of the traditions did not automatically make him a follower of Jesus, an authentic believer. And actually did what we see it doing in Matthew and Mark. Led him to oppose Christ. So I think there's a warning here. Bad tradition can, can downright lead you the opposition of Christ himself. Uh, the other one that's negative, uh, Colossians 2.8. So see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. What was that scripture? Colossians 2.8. Very clearly there, you can have traditions that are not according to Christ. And that's the concern. He's not saying tradition is inherently bad. The tradition that is not according to Christ is a concern. You need to be auditing your tradition, watching your tradition, and make sure that you don't become bound to traditions that make you not conforming to Christ. Now, so those are the ones I do. I Probably all those actually I was pretty familiar with growing up. Uh, here's the passages I wasn't very familiar with. Um, it's two passages, 1 Corinthians 11 and 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3. 11. Verse 2 in particular has the word, but there's an issue of tradition all through the chapter. Um, and 2 Thessalonians 2, 15 and 3, 6. Um, Second Thessalonians 2.15 3.6 um, First Corinthians 11, two and Second Thessalonians 2.15 actually both read out pretty similar Second, First Corinthians 11.2 says Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you Same word uh, Second Thessalonians 2.15 says So then brothers Stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. What, ver <laughs> what, what verse is that? Second Thessalonians 2.15. So oh, oh, brothers, okay. stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. He explicitly sees both written and verbal traditions passed. Uh, First Corinthians is an interesting one, though, because chapter 11 deals with like a laundry list of issues. The, the book right. deals with a laundry list of issues. Um, head coverings, male headship in the church, communion practices all happen in that chapter. Communion practices come up later in the chapter, so you could possibly say maybe that's not a tradition thing. But when he, in chapter 11, talks about communion, he says, Now what I pass to you is what I also received from the Lord. So he's concerned with how they're doing communion. There are issues in the church for how they're doing communion. And he reminds them that he gave them, if you will, a communion tradition. I was received something and I passed it to you. I just, in this same chapter, told you the whole the traditions. I commended you because you were maintaining some. I need you to maintain some more. I think that early commendation is because the church is getting creative in a couple areas. And also, 
I don't know if this is a good move, guys. Um, back up. So, um, first one has this, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. You hear how different that is from the traditions we were extolling? Traditions that get in the way of knowing Christ. Be careful for human traditions that are not according to Christ. Paul says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I deliver them to you. Their, their, their traditions are their imitation of Paul. I want, but I want you to understand, you've, you've got this in a sense, guys. You know to imitate me because you see that I've passed the methodology of being like Jesus, traditions and habits and practices. Mm -hmm. And I do commend you because you, you guys are doing it some, but I think that but is telling you, say, here's some areas you're not doing the imitation so well. He talks about um, head coverings, and I'm, I'm not going to sort that for you today. We're like already over time. Skip down to verse 16. After him saying, here's here's some thoughts on it, and then here's meaning, and don't do this and do this. Verse 16 says, But if anyone is inclined to be contentious, he had no such practice, nor do the churches of God. He's said a bunch of very practical things, but she has no hair. If she doesn't want to cover her hair, maybe she should have it cut off. And all this. And he's like, if you want to argue about this, the last point I just want to tell you is like, Nobody else is doing something different. You want to do something else here? I'm just going to level with you. None of the other churches have a practice. And so that, and you can even argue how to read that as a negating, or is he saying, so there isn't a tradition, so do what you want, or there is a tradition, but there's nothing different. But it is interesting that he appeals to the common practices of the churches. On the head covering topic, because that's a topic, the reason we are struggling with this passage is because we don't have a lot of content dictating how we do or don't do head coverings. And so we find these passages puzzling. And he's like, y'all should already know what to do because we already have a tradition for what to do. Knock it off. Just copy me. So he, that's the near context. I think a lot of folks would do that by the more likely piece, but I think a fair point can be made that. He, Maybe the whole passage is traditions because he does this. But in following the instructions, I do not commend you. He's like, commend you for keeping the traditions. In following the instructions, I do not commend you, verse 17, because when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. And he talks about their communion practices. Some folks come to eat it early and eating it tough. It sounds like some folks might be getting drunk. And others are not getting any. And he's like, this is not. Not what I what I taught you. Um, verse twenty three. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, "This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me." In the same way, he took the cup after the supper, saying, "This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as drink it in remembrance of me." So as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, for most of you, you maybe didn't know the reference to those verses, but that was deeply familiar because mm -hmm. we very commonly read that right. during our communion. Because we caught what Paul was saying. He's going, guys, this is how we do it. This is the tradition. And he's quoting, and, and he's given us something that we just all said, okay, then... That's how we're doing it. <laughs> so he's concerned that he commends them when they keep the traditions. He links things like head coverings, but also things like how we do communion to traditions. And he interestingly links it to the Lord. He doesn't say, I pass to you what the apostles gave me. Remember, Paul didn't run around with Jesus. He met him in a vision. You know, he did meet Jesus, but I don't have any knowledge of Paul taking communion with Jesus. He's received a tradition of how to do it, or a teaching on how to do it, and he recognizes that that's not just, here's Peter's communion table liturgy. 
right? He's going, no, I received from the Lord. We have something that is Christ teaching on us. And we need to stay with it. It's um, <clears throat> communion, to, oh, like, like what he's talking about here. Wasn't it, though, part of a bigger meal? And it was just like a sort of like, uh, what do they call it? Seder? Not Seder. Uh, Some would argue it was like a Seder. Or, you, you know, where it's like you're having dinner and and then as part of it, you have this, this ritual. And I guess the question I, I have is, do we know when this became like a separate function where the meal was eliminated out of it and it became the centerpiece of a, of a separate, you know, that we now look at as church, you know. I would say there's enough debate that I would, you know, make a strong statement here. Some, the separation, I think, was, we can also say was early. Um, it was not long at all before it was consistent early, which leads some folks to say it probably always was separate. Okay. And others would favor the idea that it was a meal and then rapidly separated. And the concern was when it was part of a meal, pretend to get lost, um, the ritual essence of it. I mean, things like this Corinthian situation where people are eating a ton and people are getting drunk and Paul's going to knock it off. That attitude and concern for how to preserve it led that with that. I think, this is, I'm speaking off the top of my head, so I'm a heretic, I'm a heretic. <laughs> I think within the first 100, 150 years, you see a clear separation, even to the extent that we've uh, excavated house churches. And you've got the courtyard where they all gather got a font for doing baptism and you've got a side room for communion and hmm. so it's not even happening in the main gathering place part of that is if you're not a baptized believer you can't have communion okay so you can gather for the teaching and for the worship and you can wait out there while we go get communion um so you see this reverence even in just the ordering of things going on um before long you've got formal teaching that you can't that actually would ban uh having the meal in the same place as so a lot of your historic churches, you'll have a, a fellowship hall, but it's actually separate church hall, church sanctuary. You eat in the hall, right? We, we all grew up in churches that were super uptight about food in the sanctuary, and we don't know why. But there's deep roots to say, this is where we take communion. I don't want you to confuse this with just having a meal. Hall. We're doing something unique here. So that goes, I mean, the roots on that are deep. The debate on whether it's original really depends I mean, as far as I can tell, if you're in the camp that's moving backwards doing in the meals, you're going to argue that's what they did. Right. If you're in the camp that's not for that, you're going to argue that's not what they did. And, uh, you know, without us doing a foray into all the different church fathers and documents, mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a hard call. Um, either way, I think quests just like this should be more binding. Whatever you do, there is a concern for some reverence. Concerned that it not get confused with gluttony and you know, that everyone gets to participate. Um, and it was a concern that they do it in a traditional way. There was value in retaining this tradition. Uh, the other passage, uh, 2 Thessalonians. I'm just curious, too. Uh, just, I'm not sure if you meant this the way I took it just now, but. The whole idea, too, about who takes communion, you were saying, like, you know, they could gather, but the people, you know, only the the believers are the baptized. Now, the baptized believers. right now in America, we're so egalitarian that it's kind of like we always say we have open communion. And I'm wondering, I've, I have wondered this in the past. It's like, well, is that sort of in a way disrespecting the communion because you're allowing you have no idea what these people actually believe, and yet you're allowing them. Yeah, the roots of a closed table communion are pretty deep. It seems like communion actually, I mean, this is where traditions get so interesting. Okay. So this is where traditions get so interesting. Um, I, was, I have a, a book of ancient liturgies of uh, England. So this would be what the English churches were doing before uh, the Reformation. Because you had actually a pretty wealth of diversity. And the modern Anglican uh, Book of Common Prayer draws deeply on the English church tradition, even when they were Roman. 
and that carried forward into the Methodist book of uh, worship, which as an evangelical congregational guide was the basis for our German translated discipline that then translated back into English. <laughs> and I, what few rights and customs we have actually. So I just, I'm always curious what the roots like and how far down it can go. And so I was reading different things, but one of the things I saw reading some of that and some Parsons manuals, um, you can't take communion unless we know you're a baptized believer. So if you're traveling and you want to take communion, generally showing up at the church and hoping to take it is frowned upon. Mm -hmm. Because the priest or pastor, depending on their role in it, has a book of the registered believers in his church. It's the baptism book. When you get baptized, you write your name in the book. And so you need to come, hopefully with a letter from your pastor, and he's going to add your name to his book. So that you're on the list of people who are allowed to come take communion. You know what they call that book? Book of life. The book of life. So when they hear in, De in Revelation, is your name written in the book of life? All their churches had books of life. Right. And they were literally knew if their name was or was not written. And when you got in trouble with the church and they struck your name from the Lamb's book of life, you knew you were in deep water because if you die right now, your name's not in the book. Right. You know, most of us assume this is like a figurative book or a heavenly book, right. not a book sitting in the pastor's library. Um, Which it probably is, actually. I, I, yeah, I lean towards a heavenly book. I, I don't lean towards it being one in the pastor's library. I, right. That's a tradition that interpreted scripture and led to profound senses of insecurity and worry. I lose my salvation. When the priest got mad at me. Um, so, does this say only serve communion to baptized believers? It doesn't. That's a tradition for how to implement what it does say. Do it reverently in order. Make sure you discern the body of Christ when you do. Mm -hmm. um, so, church has grappled with it. It hasn't always been a baptized believer thing, it's been on and off. Now, I take that back. As far as I know, to my knowledge, that's been a, a bar. That you should be a baptized believer. But part of it was within the first 300 years, we settled on a process that said you couldn't get baptized until you got catechized. So if you want to convert, great, we love you. Come sit in our catechesis class, which could be anywhere from one to three years long. At the end of three years, we will baptize you frequently in the nude, and then you can have first communion. Well, when you got that ordeal, I'm sure everybody knew who was and wasn't baptized. It's pretty memorable. And you got a three-year runway, and guys longing for it, persevering and getting there. Um, but that all sounds pretty important to you, because what verse would you go to for saying baptism should be done naked? Or that you have to be catechized before you can be baptized? Uh, probably one about him being barely saved. <laughs> <laughs> They would go in naked. When they came out, they would be given a white robe. So I came and was washed. The doctor called a bath. Put off my old garments before I went in, and I put on a new garment when I came out. So even though it was a little bit weird, and they did tend to gender segregate a lot of the baptisms for deaconesses were lifesavers mm -hmm. and existed largely for that purpose. Um, so even though it's weird to us because you don't have that tradition, imagine if you remember the day you laid down your old garments came into the water and came out and put on a new white robe and took communion for the first time. That experience to you pictured what you'd gone through very graphically. That had the vulnerability, these people have literally this this church of mine, and that generally if I understand correctly the baptism would be for the church members to attend you weren't necessarily on the street getting naked. Um, so these are the people who know you, they've seen you, so this is my vulnerable community who I've entered into and taken on a new life, a new road, and joined in this intimate communion of those who take communion together. So while it's definitely tradition, and I can't think of a passage that commands you to do it that way, I can also understand why a person who grew up that way would probably think our communion is lame, trite. Mm -hmm. Probably think about the same with you know, however we choose to baptize. We haven't done them yet, so. Mm -hmm. so I'm not trying to 
swing in. I want you to be exposed to the passages. I want you to see that there are some concerns. We, biblically, traditions that lead you away from Christ is a real concern. Traditions that cause you to misunderstand Christ, even to be offended by Christ, because you have appetites that disagree with them, are a real issue in, on the biblical level. Uh, my Orthodox priest, Father Demetrius, would say any tradition that is not revealing Christ has lost its value. He'd say tradition is only meant to reveal Christ. If it's not doing that, it's worthless. Um, praise God for Orthodox guys will say that. On the same token, there's a place for, for Christ-exalting tradition. How far you want to go with that? I'm going to leave you to read the passages and struggle. But this much you should do. Paul said, be imitators of me as I'm an imitator of Christ. I would encourage you to watch people who look and live like Jesus, mature saints, and not just seek teaching from them. By all means, do that. But to some level, you should seek disciplines, traditions from them. I am working on cultivating prayer disciplines with my wife. They are not randomly calculated. I watched my grandparents pray. I was deeply moved and convicted by their life character and the fact that they were people of prayer. And I've always hoped that my home, my relationship with my wife, would include the prayer disciplines of my grandparents. And they prayed down through lists like crazy. And, uh, Christy and I have begun collecting lists of people we want to pray for. Some of them asked us to, some of them we have taken it upon ourselves to pray for them anyway. Um, and we pray. Remember these folks? We pray two, three times a week together for them. We're interceding for broken marriages, we're interceding for salvation. And, uh, it's deepening our unity around Christ, centering our marriage around Christ in some beautiful ways. I see how a prayer discipline of a couple, how we do it doesn't, I wouldn't say I've got a Bible verse that says do it the way we do it, but I do remember um, my grandparents all the way to their nursing home days being these sort of people. So I got a tradition I want to copy from some people that imitated Christ well. If you want to know teaching better, you need good traditions. Because your traditions will shape your appetites. Whether you theologically think it's authoritative from the Catholic Orthodox sense, either way, your traditions will authoritatively interpret Scripture for you because they train your heart. So I'm not going to, you know, totally untangle that ball for you. We have fun with it. Obviously, I'm Protestants, the EC Church. We do not have a language of holy tradition or anything like that. Um, but we also come to this line out of Anglicanism, even though we are the least traditional of the sons and daughters of Anglicanism, there's a little threads of tradition left. Um, and I'm okay with that, because most of what we got left is what I think is some pretty good stuff. Um, but, but rate it on how it represents Christ, rate it on how it's training people and the appetites and hearts, because tradition does actually empower them to notice things, to feel things, to get passionate about things. If you have the right tradition, I think you will have deeper experiences in Christ's presence, deeper communion, deeper baptism, but deeper shoes off at the door, deeper couples for your time. There's potential there for you to see Christ in some ways you haven't, then you let tradition train you. So that would be my encouragement on a pastoral level. But I just want you to see there is positive verses and negative verses. Scripture goes both ways. Is there comments on tradition? At least help you kind of look at what we say. What's the role of tradition in the Christian faith? Well, it's it's present. We all have tradition, and it can be good or bad depending if it reveals Christ. There's a close proximity or a close parallel between tradition and habit. Yeah, yes. And uh, building good habits into your life uh, tends to be a personal issue. That is, the habits that I have, I usually have established in order to preserve or to protect me from something I know about myself. 
whereas traditions, I tend to believe, are for the better, the greater good. Uh, that these help either teach or preserve the faith or something, but it's more of a group. You know, think about what it does to you. Right. But yeah, I would agree with you. There's not much distinction between a habit and a tradition. Yeah. Except that potentially tradition should be something that you can have a habit, I have a different habit, and that doesn't bother us. Right. But we feel like our traditions ought to sync up. You know, if, if you do Christmas differently than I do, well, that's your Christmas, this is mine. No. It's like that TV tray comment. I don't know if you've ever you know, made a habit of using TV trays, but those other people's tradition habit was bothersome. And so your tradition is defined by I'm this, not that. <laughs> tradition tends to do that. It's habit. habits that have ascribed deep meaning and now carry deep group value systems carried in it. I do think good tradition does help carry values on through generations. But I also think the warning that bad tradition made an entire generation struggle with Jesus. Mm -hmm. So we need to have a tradition that is Christ exalting, Christ centered. So you go through Christmas and Thanksgiving. I hope your eyes are open and just be thinking, what are my traditions? How do they shape me? Well, that's a wrap as far as the online video goes. I have to wait till they close it before I make awkward comments or talk about bathrooms. <laughs>